such a strong opening right there. Are you kidding me? We're back, Tim. We're back. We teased it a little bit at the end of last week. We were talking about support staff, and now we're talking about working with coaches. So how can we set ourselves up for success in working with coaches? There's a, so I think there's some interesting things to talk about. The maybe 2000-ish, 2010s gets into this insurgence of a high-performance modeling and this utopia of everyone's working in collaboration and in unity for the common good uh, or the common goal, right? And mm -hmm. that's great. We're not hired by a sports scientist or a, someone with a master's degree or doctorate in sports management. We're hired by a football coach or a basketball coach and they want an archetype or they want an avatar. And if they wanted you to break down sports science or have a, a really big list, and it's getting better. I, I think the, the realization that these are assets and these are things that we can leverage in our setting it's not as much of a fight or it's not as much of like, oh, you're that kind of coach, you know, like it's not that there's no stigmatism associated with it as much as before. But when we get into that, there's that like expectation of I learned something new or I'm more competent or more qualified. I can bring a little bit more value to the greater goal. Will that be as received as much as I want it to be? And I think before we get into that, like working with coaches, we got to address an elephant in the room. Which you should, just because you learn something new or you're capable of doing something doesn't mean it's necessarily needed. And it doesn't mean that you don't need to get out there and sell it or get a better approach of explaining why we need to go through this. And that, that's a big dis disconnect for a lot of strength conditioning coaches working with sport coaches because you can get this like elitism with like, I have exposure to organizing practice plans and ma managing stress and workloads. So therefore I should have a key, a key role in designing practices and annual periodization and having a massive influence on what we do with our athletes, when we do with our, what, when we do that with our athletes and how much we do what we're doing. And it's not necessarily as easy as like, I got a master's degree in, in exercise physiology. So therefore I'm the, a resource here. It's just not that direct line that we hope for. The uh, win friends and influence people. Much we talked about working with sports medicine last week. It's just they're gatekeepers and their assets and a lot of things. And, you know, it's better, it's better to apply honey in this situation and try to figure out a way to, to create an ally and a person that will advocate for you and your, your value. And that's just common sense. And I'm the first person to talk about of, I would struggle with a lot of areas and banging my head against a brick wall because of my ego or my pride or maybe potentially some sort of elitism that was not necessarily fair or constructive and who suffers the athletes and we get into this territorial aspect, but working with the coaches first and foremost, is there is an elephant, there's an elephant in the room also with the, you know, as Roosevelt will classify as man in the arena, right? The, the critic will be someone who really never really judges anything. So it's easy for me to cast judgment off a football coach who's trying to do their best to win games with their exposure, their experience, their knowledge, or what they value. And you to go, it's not the best thing to do from a biomechanics or a physiology or psychology or just organizing this to be robust. And they're looking at you as you're not really taking into consideration all these other variables that are important to you playing football or basketball at a higher level. And they might associate with like, you didn't, you can't really understand it. You didn't play, you know, especially someone like myself, like, and I'm not thinking that like my confidence definitely overcomes that, but I would say this, of there is an element of, do you really understand what's going on out here? And can you appreciate and have empathy for them? So there's all these like dynamics going on, but one of the things I think is so clear is this central theme of we're probably brought in by that entity and we have an allegiance and alliance to that person. And just like any relationship or marriage, there's a dynamic of you could have good days and bad days and, and there's going to be, oh, Hey, I'm held hostage to what this person wants to do. So we have to figure out a way to make that work for everything else. Right. We just got them in a 24 period practice, full contact. We're doing special teams in the middle of like after period 12, because why not? 
and athletes are dead and they have really nothing left in the tank and you get them in for a lift after practice and they got nothing and you're going to make it work and you got to meet the athletes where they're at and you got to support them. And you might feel like they're holding them back from the, from the athletic trainer and the athletic trainer now stayed till 9 PM because you got to get a lift in after practice and they got to treat these guys after they get their lift. But I get mine before you get yours. So that's it is what it is. And you wonder why your athletic trainer doesn't like you or you wonder why the kids resent like having a lift, you know, cause like, I'm still going to be here till nine 30 at night and you get to go home, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's like these like dynamics that we can kind of be naive to, um, whether it's unintentional or intentional. And then this other end of it, it's this working with the coach. That's they're not doing these things because they are stupid or want to sabotage their, their program. They're doing a lot of these things because they think it's going to give them the best chance to win. And there's, I know this will come off as like, I hope it doesn't come off as patronizing, but there is this approach with flat earthers and, and looking at it from a physicist perspective. And there's this like level of what are we trying to cast judgment on? They're curious. They're not accepting the physical world and what a, someone else would say is true as gospel until they go through their process to try to really understand it. And yes, it could be influenced by polarizing figures or people with a little bit more charisma and conviction. Isn't that similar to what we're doing in strength conditioning? Yeah. Right? Like, you know, show me your weight room. I can see your philosophy and I can see your, the way you approach everything. And I could see probably, I could probably get it to the point of the way you communicate and the verbiage and the words you use. I could probably pick, tell you what logo you're going to put on your t-shirt for the off season. Right? And that like we all get attached to ideologies and biases and agendas. Football coaches, they're different. And the central thing, like I could be this, I could just dis completely disagree with your strength conditioning philosophy or your on-field philosophy or your return to play philosophy from a sports medicine. But the central thought that we often lose sight of is no one's doing this to sabotage the outcome. They're trying to do this based off the knowledge and the exposure and what they think could be successful at, to be as good as possible every year. And I think we can often get lost in that like thought process of like, we're all trying to win. So if we come back to the original example, which I talked about in the onset, this, this vision of unified theory of, of training and, and programming and coaching and everything with the high performance model, it's that we do have an element of that. Everyone wants to win because there's a stipulation. If we don't win, we lose our job. So there's that pressure. There's a stipulation if you win consistently at a higher and higher level that you make a lot more money. So there's that expectation. And then the other end of it, it's most people in the coaching because they're competitive. And it, put aside the professional and the, and the monetary value, there is a level of people want to win for that proof that they're good at what they do. And if you're working with a coach and they have this crazy plan, Maybe it's misguided, but maybe it's in their mind and their heart, the best way we can help our team perform at a higher level on Saturday. And I think we should start with that before we start to cast judgment or criticize in any way, and then try to figure out middle ground and compromise. Like, okay, can we do an, a version of that that doesn't set our guys back three days and limit our ability to get a lift in or come back and practice tomorrow? or make them go to treatment for the next five days because they're just not going to be recovered in time. And I think that's the part. So working with the coaches, having a, a common ground of, we all want to win. We all want to provide the best level of, of service and performance for our athletes and clients. Let's just do that and having empathy for that. So that's probably the first thing we need to talk about with communication because that, that's often, and I'm just as victim as much as anything, um, which kind of segues way into like, and I'll let you go ahead and ask your next question, but it makes me think a lot about this. If you have this, I have two master's degrees, constantly reading books, no one's out working me in terms of educating myself, that my counterparts might feel some sort of imposter like syndrome. Like I don't have as much competency in my domain as you, but I have more authority or I have more, I have more veto power than you. So I can assert myself in a certain way. And if I'm intimidated by you, I'm threatened by you. Maybe I feel like you are, you are maybe judging me in a, a way like, that phenomena of imposter like syndrome, that that's pretty easy to understand why that happens. And you gotta wonder, like it's people just don't wake up in the morning like, I'm gonna make that guy's life harder. 
don't think there's enough time and there's enough like enough energy to do that. Like I just don't, especially when we have such a competitive landscape and everyone buying for everyone else's everyone else's job and trying to win more every year. Like I, I don't think anyone's taking a pettiness about like I'm gonna make that strength conditioning coach's life a little bit harder because why not? I don't think that's happening. But if you're walking around arrogant and judging everyone and talking about how much harder you're working or how much more you care or how much better than you are at what you do, and maybe you're backing it up at a high level, the response to that will be, okay, I'm going to apply my authority or my veto power over you because that's the way I'm going to balance the scales here. And then you get, you get frustrated by that where you're disassociating your general demeanor approach. And I'm, I'm speaking a lot firsthand as what I've been doing, which I think hopefully is coming off when we're talking about this stuff, which was the, was the tone of the book as well. Of like, all I can do is leverage my personal anecdotal experiences, but I think there's an authenticity to that. And we can talk about that as, as we go through a lot of these conversations that, you know, do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. But on the other end of it, it's all right. Like if we're as critical of the path to becoming a strength coach as possible and objective about it as possible. And there's the, I'm going to collect as much knowledge and skill as possible, but yet I'm out of a job and I'm going to field, doesn't get it. Coaches don't get it. They're idiots. I think you're being naive to the fact that you missed a central theme. It's a people industry and coaching and working with athletes is collaboration and, and having synergy with your counterparts and having this, this connectedness to everyone. And there's always these moments of like, I'll disagree with you. You disagree with me. We might get into like an argument. We might actually get like a, almost on the verge of some sort of physical fight. But after a win, we're hugging, we're celebrating because we all had that. We wanted to be good. And I think if mm -hmm. we can understand that versus harboring resentment and judgment and being like, it's actually just juvenile and petty with a long, like, then you're going to dry up your opportunities regardless of how much knowledge and skill. Maybe you're that good where you can. You can supersede any like personal character flaw, but it only lasts so long. Like in the coaches that have great longevity and have a career arc that is something to be envied, probably have a better ability to connect with coaches than the ones that are cerebral and don't want to take the time to for foster that relationship. It's funny you mentioned that. I, as I reflected on this past school year, my first year here, I got feedback like, hey, you're really unapproachable. I'm like, wow, I had no idea. Cause I'm like, in my head, I'm this open book. Like, you want to know something, come after. But like, that's not the, that's not what I'm giving off. That's not my vibe. So obviously that's something I need to work on. That's something I'm taking into, into the next school year. But like, it may be something like unconscious like that, that you have no idea. Like, I'm not trying to be unapproachable. Yes, I'm really confident in what I do. Yes, I want to get really great results. Yes, I really want to help you win. But wow, I was not trying to give off those vibes. So it's also, it's important to seek out that outside feedback and now to bring it back to my question it was a very long-winded explanation there have you found that have you found a way to get to that middle ground quicker or is it more like bide your time just kind of control what you can control in the weight room and then once once it's ready like let that feedback rip or or what have you found to be the most successful in, in working with coaches and, and meeting in the middle there because like you said we all want to win how do we get there faster start with the to start with what we talked about before of we all have that we all have a desire to win and perform at a higher level we all want to help we all want to serve our athletes we shouldn't have this like i think one-sided judgment of they're just in this for clout or money because you're such a you're such a noble person would you do it for free you know i'm not turning down six figures you know like you know like i'm not above that either so mm -hmm. you're your, criti your criticism is one-sided and unfair. I think one of the more important things I learned is having a good staff in the weight room. And I'm not the kind of guy who would go out for a beer after, after work with anyone. I just have it. Don't like doing it. I don't, I'm pretty much naturally introverted. So I enjoy my solace and my privacy where I have staff that's very extroverted and enjoy spending time with people like. I don't like to golf. I don't like to do these things, but also too, of like having a group that's confident enough and knowing that I have enough faith in them and knowing enough trust in them to tell me the truth, like you're being an asshole, like mm -hmm. you're not being, you're, you're the one who's not being fair in this situation. 
Yeah. No one loves to hear that criticism. Trust me. It's hard. I'm not impervious to it. But if I'm the one who's being difficult, I'm not going to see that. And I probably won't believe the counterpart for that because I feel like they're insecure and they're jealous. Versus if I have someone in the weight room that's working with me that I trust, that I have a mutual respect for, that I've given them the feedback and they've taken it well. And yet on the other end of it, and they'll give me feedback because they're afraid to, or they think it's a, a very much a marriage of convenience. Like they just need this person to like get another job. They think that's a, that's a pretty good indicator that you are the problem. And I am so fortunate after having really good coaches that will tell me because I wouldn't be as inclined to do that with a sport coach. I just wouldn't. And I've learned that over time. And I, for the record, like I, I enjoy conflict and I think that's hard for a lot of people because I have conviction and I always really feel like I'm not just coming to a decision without really thinking about it, without some sort of conscious effort to make that decision. And there's a level of, I guess, authority, or if you're applying that much effort in every single decision that you're making, that you feel like you are impervious to criticism or counter. And it's, that's not it. Like, but I'm going to be pretty compelling in an argument if you disagree. I'm just that much more prepared, which may or may not mean me being right. It just means I put more effort into coming to a conclusion than you have. So it might just lead to a default, like whatever, you seem like got this under, under control. I don't really want to question it. And then it gets into like what I feel like not as objective of a conversation about what I'm doing, more about subjective, how I'm doing. it, And I find that's semantics and I find that just seemingly unimportant right like the and eh, vibe was down the music wasn't great like these are all subjective appraisals of what i'm doing because you lack the objectivity to see what i'm really doing and you put blinders up to my objectivity about doing my job at a high level might be above questioning because i've created a place where people are like eh, it's just not worth it i just i just rather not have it but it actually might come at the cost of us doing it the best possible way where sport coach coming to that, we talked about imposter syndrome of like the level of detail and effort I'm putting in every single strength conditioning session versus I mean, I've been in long meetings about practice plan, but I can also tell you I've been in three hour meetings where we probably talked under 15 minutes about a practice plan and two hours and 45 minutes plus about seemingly nothing. And like, it's a lot of time spent and there's a lot of, a lot of, checking the the box of being there and talking about we're preparing to have the best practice possible but there's another end of it that 15 minutes that i'm allocating toward session planning with my my strength conditioning staff and my programming far surpasses whatever we're doing in a in, in a practice plan and it could be i've been doing this for 40 years like i don't need to have a very elongated conversation about what we're doing on a tuesday practice going into this team that we've played the last 10 years mm -hmm. it could be that and i'm not saying they're poor they're just they figured out what they're going to do and they just do it. And like, and the rest is like filled up with like, I love being, I love being at the facility. I love being with my coaches. I love here. And I just, I express that in a way that I want to share that. And like, I think that part is if I have a good strength conditioning staff and they're able to say to me, you're the one who's being difficult. You're the one who's not really listening to your counterpart and, and you're negatively associating what they're being critical and then, and then the part where i just described before of that like you're just you're just latching on to subjective appraisals that i can't put my i can't take my time and concern with that is that might be the entry point to them feeling more comfortable to talk about things that are more objective but if i'm just shooting that down like that's silly subjective show me something that i can measure or tangibly say we can improve upon if not quit don't waste my time and then we get into this level of Oh, but I might actually been like the, the first step to them going into something more objective, but I shot down the thing in front of it. Well, is that open discourse? Is that really collaboration? Is that really there? Or it could be I'm harboring resentment because I'm in a meeting and I have no ability to contribute or communicate to how we should structure our practice to get the best, the best workloads and stress or work recovery type of planning. 
And I take that over into the weight, the weight room or the off season strength conditioning. And I'm like, yeah, I'm above reproach. I don't want to have a conversation about what I'm doing because you don't do that with me. But again, I'm not really good at selling what I do or focus on. And, and one thing I want to be clear on, I can totally see this as I'm giving, I'm giving sport coaches the out versus athletic trainers. I maybe I'm like a little hypercritical. I could say that someone would probably be that. And that could be just the, I view us as, I don't like this connotation of we're support staff and sport coaches are this like, you know, separate entity that's, they're just above like criticism. But I do think that like when I resonate with anyone in the athletic department, it's typically a sport coaches that I have as much of a, of a thought that they are equal in their interest in winning and performing at a high level. And maybe there's less sort of, there's a level of the rest of the counterparts are more in their own like self-preservation. That's a casting of judgment that might not necessarily be fair. And there are plenty of sport coaches that I'm playing the long game here. I wouldn't mind being part of administration and moving up or moving out of coaching because I want to stay here. And there's plenty of athletic trainers and nutritionists that like, I want to be as good as humanly possible. And I don't really care who's in my way because I want to be, I want to be up there in the upper echelon. Like I want my legacy to be the best in the industry ever. Like there's that as well. And I just find that the collective or on average that when I work with a sport coach that you're behooved to move up and prioritize performance and doing as best as humanly possible. So when I have an argument with them, like I feel like it's from a place of they're the same. They want to be as good as humanly possible versus an athletic trainer. It's like, I don't really want to bother the team doctor. I don't want to screw this up for me and I don't want to get fired or I don't want, I want to be here next year. I don't want to have this ally and relationship versus you're probably going to get fired in the end of the year. Like, how am I going to have the same thing? But what I need to do in this moment is just be fair again, to remind everyone that this is my anecdotal experience and this is a typecasting and there's probably some stuff that's evolved and changed. And there's another level. There's plenty of strength conditioning coaches that value longevity. And there's an element, there's a nobility to that of, I want to be here. I want to have a legacy at the school or this organization for a long time because I, I value this community. I value this group. I want to, I've seen freshmen become seniors and great men and women that have gone off in the community and served this, served this area from a commerce or from a like just community standpoint at a high level. And that matters to me. And like, there's not, there's a lot right with that. I'm just talking short term wise and, and having a very, very career centric, very pretty much myopic focus on being the best strength coach I could possibly be at all costs. And then walking around an athletic department and talking to sport coaches, talking to athletic trainers, talking to nutritionists. And I'm wondering in the back of my mind, like, are we on the same page for what is our short term and long term plan? When we have an argument and we have this, this lack of, of consistency with our expectations, that's when I'm like, ah, I have a hard time resonating with your message versus, versus another level of, again, you have to understand the audience and what their incentives and agendas are and try to f find some middle ground. And it's okay to want to be somewhere, somewhere, somewhere short. It's okay to want to be somewhere long. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at that athlete in front of you, are you doing the best job you could possibly do? Are you exhausting all potential options? Are you being, being able to get on a table and stand with conviction that this is what we need to do when something's not being done right versus are you open to criticism saying, are you really honestly thinking about this objectively? And I'm going to look at some subjective stuff, objective stuff. I'm going to communicate to athletes, other coaches. And I really think we need to evaluate this. We need to have this collaboration that we want to put together the best product on the field or the court, are you able to do that? And there's, there's a glass house effect. Like I am not perfect. And I tell, I'm sure a lot of other strength conditioning coaches and sport coaches, if they ever get a chance to listen, this will probably describe it. like, yeah, sometimes it's hard to work with. Sometimes it's kind of a jerk. Like, but it also too, like, I know, I know he's working at it. So it's hard to, hard to be that like overly critical. But maybe it just plays out to, I just don't want to work with them again. You just don't want to be on the same staff with them. It's exhausting. It's not fun. It's, it's challenging. It is what it is. And that's, that's part of it as well. I wanted to come back to, you mentioned maybe it being related to being bad at selling what you do. 
how can we go about selling what we do and the advantages we bring to coaches who may be a little hesitant or maybe even parents and athletes and just in general, how, how do we go about selling ourselves and, and what we bring to the table? It's all about getting them to understand that this is in their best interest as much as ours. The immediate association would be you're doing this for, for credit. You're doing this for, you want your idea to be the right idea. That's the default, right? Like, especially mm -hmm. if we're like, that's wrong, we should do this. Like, uh, how do you not come to that conclusion? Versus in the other end, like I'm an assistant strength coach. I'm working for a head coach, head strength coach, and they're set in their ways. We start to subliminally hit that. I'm like, Hey, I heard we, I we should do this. I just read this article. Like, Tom, don't talk to me. You're just a kid. Or I go out a different way. Like I heard this highly regarded strength conditioning coach that you respect is doing this. We should consider it. Like, oh, that's great. They're doing that. Or we go out in another way of, we just do it. And like, what are you doing? Like, oh, I just was experimenting with this thing. Like, what do you think we knew this as a team? Like, I don't know. Or maybe just one day that coach comes in and you've told them several times over and they're like, Hey, I think we're going to do this, but that was your idea. And you've told them countless times, but they feel like they came to that conclusion organically and they had like an epiphany and they just now are suddenly now this just transcended to a whole nother level or a of coach. What will happen is as a assistant strength coach, you'll feel unimportant. You'll feel undervalued. Who cares? You're doing what's necessary, right? If it's something that you feel like would progress the level of training that you can do with your athletes, you're going to get the job done. And there's a selling of that. There's a subliminal of that. I think in the end, the head coach probably understands like that transformation into doing something different was multivariate, multi-pronged and su supported by your staff. And they'll come out in ways like a collective, like I got a great staff and you know, I got really smart staff and they're always pushing us to get better. But they're not going to get on the table saying like, Tim's really strong. Really, he's the smartest guy in the room. He's the best coach we got better than me. Like, why would they do that? Like, I would probably be like, well, let's get rid of that guy. Let's get that guy who's smarter and better at what he does. Like, oh, it's natural, you know? And there's an allegiance too of like, I hired him, you know, like I knew he was smart. I knew he was capable and I knew he was going to challenge us. So like, they give you your credit when they give you a paycheck, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like what Don Draper said, like, that's what the money's for. <laughs> like, I don't need to say thank you. Like, why, like you give me ideas, you know, like that's, that's a thank you. Like you get paid, but the other end of it, of working with the coaches and talking to them and getting into this of like, how do you convince anyone to buy anything? It's telling them that they're important and telling them that, Hey, you, your ideas matter. And you know, the, the adage of they don't know how much, they don't care how much you know to, they know how much you care. Like that's selling an athlete is the same thing as selling a coach. It's a belief that we're all in this together. It's a, your opinion matters. It's my experiences and my knowledge can help us. And I'm, I want us all to come together, but it's this like breaking down that wall of, oh, this person just trying to get credit or get more money or step over me and get to a, something that they want. Like if it is genuine, we want to do the best thing we can for our athletes. You know, that's where you got to figure out how to convey them. And it's. The, I think the default would be like, all right, this person just looking for their own personal rise and that, that creates defensiveness. And the only way to combat that is patience and developing trust and rapport and being selfless in that it's not about me getting credit. It's more about doing the right things that are in the best interest of athletes. And in the end, if we're performing at a higher level, all of that good credit and goodwill will be extended to us somehow, some way, you know, that rising mm -hmm. tides raise all boats. That's where it's going to come out. And it depends on your role too. You know, if I have a, a lot of authority and clout and I've been at a place for a long time and that head football coach or head basketball coach puts a lot of trust in me and I'm their consigliere in a lot of ways, they're like, you're going to be the default. And there's a lot of pressure on you to be on the other end of that and say, I need to be open to suggestion and there's no bad suggestions. Let's just put it on the table and not being dismissive. Like we did it, but you know what? Maybe it was the wrong time. We're at the wrong group. Let's try to revisit. Let's, let's see if we do, we're going to do that. Let's exhaust that option. And you know, like you think about some of the most high performing organizations in the world, they're taking feedback from everyone, like everyone from janitorial to lunch hall, to, to head football coach, like to CEOs, like they're all 
soliciting feedback from each other. And if they're capable of doing that, not all of it's great. Not all of it's like yielding. It might be just, it might just be just white noise. Like your opinion matters, put it in the suggestion box. And then that goes into a shredder and no one ever talks about it again. You know, that like could be it. Or it could be, you mean to tell me that the person who's doing the job five days a week, 40 hours a week, busting their ass, doesn't know the best way to do something? I should listen to that person. I should. Like, they're going to have a really good perspective on how to way do this more efficiently. You know, Sam Wall would say, the best place to go if you're an owner of a company is into the break room and hear everyone bitch about this aspect that sucks where we could do this better. You're getting million-dollar ideas from the people that are doing it. They're finding, the, they're finding the weak spots and the gaps earlier than everyone else. So from that perspective of being willing to do that and having two ears and one mouth and shutting up and listening and you hire people for a reason. If you don't value their opinion, you shouldn't have hired them. Hire better people. And that level too, if you're the person who got hired and your opinion doesn't matter, probably means you're not as good as you think you are or you're not as good as you're what you think you are, what you think you could do as well as you should. Wow, well put. This was awesome. You really brought the heat today. A lot of good, a lot of good tidbits. So I hope everyone brought their pen and paper because I thought this was awesome. I know I was taking a bunch of notes here. You just don't stop. You can't be stopped. You got it, man.